This Week in Microbiology is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at asm.org slash twim. This is TWIM, This Week in Microbiology, episode 251, recorded on September 16th, 2021. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast that explores unseen life on Earth. Joining me today from Ann Arbor, Michigan, Michelle Swanson. Hello. How did it get to be September? Yeah. It goes by Woo. and it's football season, right? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and football players wear masks, uh, Michelle? No, they do not. Wow. I guess that would be, they would just come off in a second, right? <laughs> they wear mouth guards, but that's not going to help much. Yeah. That just keeps their teeth in place. Right. Also joining us from Charleston, South Carolina, Michael Schmidt. Hello, everyone. Football season there too, Michael? <laughs> it's football season here, but it still feels like full summer. Today we're getting a little cool spell. It's down to only 84 or 29 degrees C, so it's actually pleasant today, but it's cloudy and rainy. Yeah, here we're having an Indian summer, as they say, where we shouldn't call it Indian summer anymore. We should probably call it Global First, Nation, First Nation summer. Or, or climate change. <laughs> Right. But then people will jump all over you. That's true. All right. Let's move on to science. Today we have a snippet in a paper. As usual, it's my pleasure to deliver the snippet, which was actually brought to my attention by Michael. Michael was scanning Applied in Environmental Microbiology, and both both papers are from that journal. Yep. <laughs> the snippet. It's quite is, provocative. Uh, yeah, I grabbed this because this is about viruses, although it's a subject that we we talk about a lot in microbiology. The title is Biofilms in Coronavirus Reservoirs, a Perspective Review by Rafael Gomez von Borowski and Daniel Silva Trentin from the uh, the Institut Genetique, well, let's say the Université de Rennes and the... Um, Universidad Federal de Ciencias de, da Sode de Porto Alegre in Brazil. Right? Ren is in France. Uh, so biofilms and viruses, two words you don't often hear together. We always talk about biofilms and microbes, right? Mm -hmm. But um, you don't hear too much about viruses, but that's what this uh, article tries to uh, put together, at least you know, raise some ideas, maybe stimulate some research. To be honest, the focus is on coronaviruses, but we don't have a lot of data for biofilms and coronaviruses. Uh, there's some data in other virus systems, which we'll talk about. But the, the, the idea, as the title suggests, is to um, try and figure out if biofilms play a role uh, in coronavirus infections multiple aspects of infection, but in particular, uh, as we know, m probably all the coronaviruses originated in bats at some point in the previous thousands of years. So um, they, they're trying to put together a hypothesis for uh, viruses in bats uh, in general. So just to review, the, the, the paper starts out by reviewing what we know about the coronaviruses. I think everyone knows we, sh we currently have a pandemic driven by one <laughs> called SARS-CoV-2, right? Which um, most likely originated from a bat because the most similar viruses are in bats, but that's still a work in progress. And then, of course, we have uh, two other what we call epidemic human coronaviruses. We have SARS, original SARS-CoV, which came out in 2002 and um, was really wiped out after it infected 8,000 people uh, globally. So it never became a pandemic, technically. That one came from bats. We found the source of that one. And then we have MERS coronavirus, which uh, continues to sporadically infect humans, mainly in the Arabian Peninsula. The virus typically spills over from camels. Camels are very 
numerous in that region. They're used for labor, for pets, for food and milk. And uh, there's a lot of human camel contact. And the, the camels are actually uh, all mostly infected at birth or shortly after birth have a mild respiratory disease, and then they may pass it on to people who can get very ill. But that virus also probably originated many years ago from a bat somewhere. So those are the three epidemic coronas. Then we have four common cold coronaviruses with with the various names like 229E and OC43 and HKU and some other, and one other. And those are probably also spilled over years ago from uh, animal reservoirs. But those are quite mild. They cause very moderate common colds, very little mortality unless you're uh, immunocompromised. But they all seem to have originated most likely from bats. So, And if I could just interject, their figure one lays out what Vincent just described in a really clear schematic. So yeah. for those of you who are interested in, in coronaviruses, how did they emerge, you know, the, the span, um, I encourage you to take a look. You yeah. can also, you know, attend a dinner party with non-science folks and there you go. You know, make a convincing argument that we didn't create it in a lab. For sure. <laughs> Not For sure. just from figure one, but yes. <laughs> so that's a, that's a short history. By the way, the the coronas uh, were studied for years uh, as animal pathogens, livestock and and wild animals, before we focused in on uh, human pathogens. And so this this is this review article which is what it is I should have said that at the top tries to address a connection between biofilms and infections of bats. And some of the observations are that bats are infected with many viruses including coronaviruses and they seem to persist uh for many years. They seem to do well with the immune system of bats and they seem to be not pathogenic. Now that's that's a bit of a tough conclusion because we don't do many observations of bats in the wild, right? And mm. so we mm. actually don't know if they're always not pathogenic, these virus infections of bats. Um, and in fact, if you speak with people who work on bat viruses, they will say, you know, that conclusion that these viruses don't affect bats is, may not be correct because we just don't know. And nobody infects bats in the laboratory as far as I know, so... I was also fascinated to, to read that um, bats are the only mammals that have achieved self-powered flight. That's right. And they make up 20% of all classified mammal species. That's and correct. And they have a huge geographical range, which means they can spread their feces and viruses uh, far right. and wide. Although, in, fa- in, pr- in principle, most bats don't have a huge range. So bats mm. will, you know, they can range maybe a th- one or 2,000 kilometers at the most. But they're not going to go from continent to continent, that's for sure. They're not like birds. An individual will not, yeah. but the population. Yeah. So the idea is that you have big populations of bats that are full of viruses. They spread them to each other uh, quite readily, and then humans intervene and, and get infected. Now, uh, Michelle, that's an interesting topic. Uh, but did you know that rodents are 40% of all mammals? No. <laughs> they outnumber bats. Of course, they can't fly. Um but they're everywhere. I mean, I just caught a mouse the other day here in my house where they mm-hmm. live with us, uh, despite our not wanting to. And I think they are also a, a serious potential source of uh, new pathogens. So many of the things that are discussed here could apply to uh, rodents as well. Hmm. And one of the more provocative statements that they make is that immune tolerance against chronic viral infections came with flight. Yeah. So it leads me to wonder, since the human race is the only other mammal that has learned how to fly, (laughs) whether or not we will become tolerant to persistent viral infections. Well, you're being funny, I guess, because... I'm, I'm being a little bit provocative, but if you think about it, we certainly have become tolerant to HIV. Uh, because we were smart enough to invent medications that has made it a chronic yeah. disease rather than a death sentence. So the flight that, that bats achieve, of course, it, flight is uh, energetically very demanding and you make a lot of, uh, you burn a lot of ATP and you make a lot of uh, oxygen radicals. And so they can damage tissues. And so the idea has arisen that 
the bad immune system deals with that well. And in fact, if you look at the bad genome, a lot of the immune response genes are, are, are duplicated and triplicated, hmm. presumably to do that. So the ideas arising are the hypothesis that bats' uh, immune systems are very effective, but they can also modulate themselves so they don't overreact, and maybe that's why they do well with viruses. Uh, some mm-hmm. evidence for that, but you know, it's hard to test because you can take bat cells in, the, in a culture dish, but it's you know they're not flying around and, and doing the things that bats do. So I think it's an interesting idea. As I read that bit about um, the immune system, I often then wondered whether or not bats are more resistant to cancer because cancer is thought to result from free radicals interacting with our genome, resulting in epistatic events that lead to the uncontrolled growth of, of cells. Mm-hmm. And, and so you wonder whether we should be looking at bats to better understand how to make the better mousetrap, if you will, to control cancer. Well, in fact, bats do have a lower incidence of cancer than you would expect. And maybe that's from having a really good immune system. Mm-hmm. You so are maybe, so well read, Vincent. I'm impressed. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know about cancer incidents in bat. Well, we we actually have done uh, papers about bat immune systems on my various pods. And so mm. uh, that came up in one of them for sure. I don't know if I'm well read or well spoken because I, I talk <laughs> to a lot of people. But um, bats are quite interesting. It may be that the immune system can explain all the viruses that are in them. Maybe you don't need to invoke biofilms. Nevertheless, let's talk a little bit about biofilms. What is a biofilm? And a cluster of microorganisms, right? We often think of them as bacteria. Think of a cluster of bacteria living together, not living singly, but in large communities, uh, which would form a film. And you can experimentally show that in many cases by by showing the film, say, attaching to a glass tube uh, or something like that. And a film is useful. You can just think about it intuitively, right? You have lots of other members of your kind there in the film that you can help and and receive help from, uh, can uh, help with nutrition, uh, dealing with uh, extreme environmental conditions. So a biofilm makes a lot of sense for microbes. And um, it's it uh, bears uh, mentioning that these films are not only made up of the microbial cells, but um, some of the cells produce extracellular matrix. Um, so they make a gel-like uh, casing that um, mm-hmm. keeps the community together and acts as a barrier yeah. to. Biocides. And of course, having but being in a biofilm makes, in many cases, of bacteria resistant, say, to antimicrobials. Right? right. So that's that's a problem and. I think we've talked about this a bit on Twi- on Twim, where we approach mm-hmm. you. Maybe you disperse the biofilm and makes them more susceptible to uh, antimicrobials, right? Right. So, what about viruses? Do vi- You know, <clears throat> you, for, take your gut. Your your intestine is a is a biofilm of bacteria right on top of your intestinal epithelial cells, uh, with uh, many different bacteria. You know, a mucin like matrix, and I'm sure there are viruses embedded in that as well. It's because we have a lot of viruses reproducing in our gut, not just the bacteriophages that infect the bacteria, but many intestinal viruses, good and bad. Uh, there is some experimental evidence uh, for viruses in, in biofilms. My favorite viruses, enteroviruses, can be found uh, in biofilms, in particular. Polio virus has been found. Mm. And, you know, these are viruses that can be in sewage where there certainly is uh, abundant biofilms. Um, and, in fact, some studies have shown that in a biofilm, the viruses are more resistant to chlorine. Enteroviruses, noroviruses are, are found in, in biofilms. And if you uh, can imagine, this would help them to attach to pipes, right? Mm-hmm. Um and so it's hard to flush them out, the viruses. They're in there and, and so forth. So now in, in connection with pipes and wastewater, uh, SARS-CoV-2, of course, RNA is found in wastewater. It's one of the ways many, many communities now are sampling their wastewater for SARS-CoV-2 RNA by PCR as an indicator of the, the level of infection in the community or as a, as a, as a warning of what may be coming, right? Right, rather yeah. than sampling each household, members of each household, they can just <laughs> <That's> <laughs> sample right. the effluent. Yep, that 
And in fact, one of our former students at the unit who's now on faculty at the University of South Carolina routinely goes and collects sewage out of the dorms. Mm. And it actually is good enough to forecast when they're going to have an outbreak. Nice. The this spike in the SARS within the effluent in the dorm it precedes the outbreak when the residents become ill. By about seven days. So mm-hmm. they can start quarantining them early? In, yes. In forced quarantine. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It, it gives them a heads uh-huh. up that an outbreak is coming. Uh-huh. And so they've been routinely screening the sewage. Yeah, that's, I think this is all wonderful. And you can sequence the genomes and see what variants are yeah. around and so forth. Now, it's important to note that we don't think that any of this represents infectious virus. So we don't have any evidence for fecal transmission of SARS-CoV-2. Um, and we don't know if there, it exists in a biofilm in sewage, but the possibility is there, especially since many other viruses have been found in biofilm. So I mentioned enteroviruses, noroviruses, rotaviruses, calici viruses, astroviruses, hepatitis A virus, and they're often mixed with uh, microbes and eukaryotic cells, bacteria of various sorts. Fungi can be part of this biofilm. So it is a... Um, complex ecosystem and, you know, exactly what the benefits might be for viruses, we just don't know. But certainly um, it could make it more permissive to um, genetic exchange, recombination. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as long as if you you have viruses concentrated, if they can infect the cell together, yeah, that could facilitate recombination, obviously, yeah. Now, there there is a study, um, which we did years ago on TWIV, actually, to me, it was the first evidence for for biofilm in viruses. It was a study out of France that looked at human T cell leukemia virus uh, type one, a retroviruses that causes leukemia in humans, and they found that um, this assembles into biofilm like uh, extracellular assemblies that are important for cell to cell transmission. And they, the authors said that the, the, the biofilms were a sort of protective form of virion community embedded in a matrix of highly glycosylated protein. So they provided some evidence that the biofilm was important for making uh, infectious particles and transmitting them. So there is some evidence and there are a variety of other um, viruses that may be involved. But what about coronavirus as well? As far as SARS-CoV-2, Microscopy has certainly revealed uh, collections of particles uh, uh, emerging from cells. Um, whether they're actually in biofilms, we we don't know. It's not been defined there. But let's assume that uh, they could be present in biofilms. Well, what would that mean? You know, it could stabilize them. It could, as Michelle said, enable more than one to uh, infect the cell. It may serve as a reservoir. It could even help the the viruses to maintain infectivity on surfaces, right? Mm -hmm. Did we talk about surfaces last time? (laughs) We did. Sampling surfaces with pieces of paper. (laughs) So it could be that when you deposit, let's say uh, a nasal sample goes out onto a surface, it's going with with, uh, polysaccharides, it could establish a biofilm on a surface and help to uh, maintain it. Um, In fact, a study out of China showed that over 90% of patients that that are positive for SARS-CoV-2 also have a variety of other bacteria within them that are pathogens like streptococci, Klebsiella, Haemophilus, and maybe they're all in a biofilm in the respiratory tract along with SARS-CoV-2. And so then they, they talk about whether such biofilms could help persistence of the virus uh, in bats, it's it's really a lot of speculation, but they suggest, well, maybe they help the virus to be persistent in the sense that it's trapped in a matrix somewhere in the bat. It's not replicating, but it's not being degraded either. It's being protected by the biofilm. And maybe that allows the virus to to remain in the bat until it can either infect the cell or infect another bat uh, as well. And so maybe in that sense, the biofilm could... Um, contribute to maintenance in, in the bats. And I have to say, there's no evidence for that. It's completely speculative. I think it'll be really hard to get because, as I said, 
we can do experiments with bat cells and culture, bat cell lines, but bats themselves, very few labs have bat colonies and um, hard to, to do work with them. Mm-hmm. But it, it makes sense. I mean, and, and the authors are very careful to point out what they understand from the literature and where they are um, hypothesizing. But yeah. um, I mean, the idea that uh, when you inhale contaminated Debris. air, it may not be a free-floating single viral particle, but rather a little bit of a biofilm yeah. where you'd get a higher dose. Yep. And so in in the bats, uh, it could act as a, as a reservoir. It could protect the, the virus particles, as I said. It could do the same in surfaces and so forth. So that's the that's the idea here. So the the summary is that they're proposing biofilms play a role in pathogenic coronaviruses in in multiple ways, perhaps in bats, perhaps in humans, perhaps uh, during transmission as well. And um, I think the idea is to stimulate some uh, research in this area. You know, sometimes you need a little push to think a little bit differently. Because mm-hmm. I, I certainly don't think much about biofilms in terms of viruses. I know my microbial colleagues do, but maybe we should uh, be thinking about it more. Certainly provocative. And And that was my intent when I picked the paper. ASM also picked it up and sent it out for folks. Uh, I stumbled into it a, a day or two before the ASM did. And you know, we, we try to look for things that will will, stim, will stimulate thought amongst our, our listeners. I have to say that I saw the ASM puts up posts on Instagram and I, I follow their feed. And I saw one of these figures. I think it was, um, yeah, figure two, biofilms and viruses showing how it mm-hmm. could go from a bat to epithelial surfaces and biofilms. And uh, I said, well, this is interesting. And then that very day, Michael... Uh, said, what about these papers? And um, that's why we're here. By the way, one of the uh, figure illustrators is Patrick Lane Mm. from a company called Science Studios who did the illustrations for Principles of Virology, the ASM Press. Really? And he's working with us on Microbe, the third edition of Microbe, an undergraduate textbook. So thank you. Oh, you should have some really cool figures then, Michelle. Oh yeah. Yeah, we we do already in Principles of Virology. I bet you don't even have that book, Michael. I do not have that book, Vincent. Oh. It, it's a little beyond my pay scale. Uh, well, no, I have isn't. an old older edition on my bookshelf, but not. Michael, I if can't you started reading you. it, you would un- be unable to put it down. You would read it for a <laughs> week straight. <laughs> Uh, you're probably right. I mean, that's the problem with me and textbooks. I I, I enjoy them. All right. Now uh, we go on to Michael, who has a paper for us. So this is uh, something a little different, but along the same lines. Um, it's entitled Outer Membrane Vesicles Derived from Salmonella Enterica Serotype Typhromerium Can Deliver Shigella Flexorni 2A O Polysaccharide Antigens to prevent Shigella flexori 2A infections in mice. And it's from a group of labs in China. Uh, and the authors are Tian, Lu, Zhu, Yu, Chen, Yu, Li, Zhang, Wang, and Lu. And they're respectively in the departments of medical microbiology, the School of Ophthalmology and Optometry, and the first affiliated hospital of Nangcheng University in Nangcheng, China, as well as the Institute of Preventative Veterinary Medicine in Sichuan Agricultural University in Chengdu, China. So today's topic will address the development against a pathogen. No, it's not SARS-CoV-2, but one that remains a serious threat to the health of citizens especially children in developing countries or any nation that has issues with its potable water supply. This microbe, Shigella, infects approximately 165 million people each year, predominantly children under the ages of five, with significant morbidity and mortality. The pathogen, Shigella, is a gram-negative, non-modal, facultatively anaerobic, non-spore-forming rod, as for my microbiology friends, <laughs> and it's differentiated from its close relative, E. coli, on the basis of its pathogenicity, 
its physiology, namely it's not a coliform, it cannot ferment lactose, or it cannot ferment decarbo- or decarboxylate lysine, mm. and its serology. It's said to be locally invasive and can manifest a pro-inflammatory response in our intestine. Bloody genus- diarrhea. <laughs> oh, yes. And it, it also gives you tremendous cramping, which as I tell the medical students and the dental students, this is really an indication that you have gone beyond an intoxication and you've crossed the threshold into a true infection. And generally fever comes along with that. And you experience symptoms one to two days after your encounter with the microbe. And unlike E. coli, where you need hundreds of thousands in order to become ill, Shigella is in as few as 10 cells can make you ill. And as I said, the symptoms commence in about two days and they include diarrhea. And you'll remember from our previous TWIMS, that's generally loose, watery stools where it fills the bottom of the cup. And the operational definition of diarrhea is you have uh, three or more loose stools per, the, per day, and you also will have the presence of blood and uh, mucus in the feces. And the mucus is generally indicative of the inflammatory response that is causing you to, to slough it out. And again, as this is an infection with inflammation, there is generally fever along with the stomach pain, and then this condition known as tensimus, which is that physical feeling that you need to move your bowels, even if you just had one and you know your colon is empty, you you still try to pass the stool, you find nothing comes out, or you, well, very little comes out, and the sensation is really quite uncomfortable. So Shigella dysentery is not a mild case of food poisoning. It's something to be reckoned with. And as I said, 165 million people get it each year, and it generally comes from bad water. And Michael, there can sim- be outbreaks, right, because oh, yeah. it can spread Out- so easily on fomites, on contaminated hands, et cetera. Because you need so few. You only need 10 in order to get it. Symptoms. Michael, how do we, I'm, I'm curious about how we know, you said hundreds of thousands, uh, E. coli and just 10. How do we know that? Do we do volunteer challenges? They did uh. in the ancient times huh. before the IRB, before, <laughs> before the IRB. Okay. When, when I was a graduate student in the dark ages in the previous century, I heard from a professor at Indiana who actually was one of the study subjects who determined you needed to eat 100 million clostridia perfringens in order to get chicken gravy food poisoning. Oof, wow. That's tough he, duty. He, he did that at the behest of the university president because the entire student body got uh, food poisoning before they went home for Thanksgiving, and the parents were <laughs> quite upset. They served him this great turkey dinner before they all dismissed him for Thanksgiving, and he said, that's how we figured out it needed 100 million. Hmm. Wow. So, but the thing to remember and appreciate about this is how this microbe causes the pathology and disease. As this is a gram negative, it's O antigen chains, which are these sugars that are attached to the lipopolysaccharide and the outer membrane of all gram negatives. The bit of chemistry you need to know is the O antigens are are formed from an oligosaccharide repeating unit that have a linear tetrasaccharide backbone comprised of three L-ramnose, and that's a naturally occurring uh, six-carbon sugar, and then one residue of Hmm. N-acetylglucosamine. And this is encoded within a region of the chromosome of 16 kilobases between the GAL-F gene, which encodes UTP glucose 1-phosphate uridyl transferase, and GND, which is the glucose 6-phosphogluconate dehydrogenase that takes the uh, CO2 uh, off of uh, the six carbons. But this is a story about vaccination. For it is the only way the human race is going to substantially and economically 
address the morbidity of mortality from this very dangerous pathogen. And so we have to digress a little to think about immunology. And I do this for the benefit of the non-immunologists listening. The humoral response is mediated by antibody molecules that are secreted by our plasma cells. And they will dump out immunoglobulin G or IgG and immunoglobulin A. The antibody that comes out on our mucosal surfaces where Shigella is principally attacking is immunoglobulin A. So what happens is the antigens, namely the bacterium, binds the B cell antigen receptor, signals the B cells, and at the same time, it's then internalized and processed into peptides that then activate our helper T cells, which effectively, you know, every one of us has become an armchair vaccinologist due to SARS. And so we understand antibodies and we understand the importance of T cells. And these authors help walk us through understanding, um, developing a good vaccine And remember, antibodies protect the host from infection, at least from bacteria, in three main ways. They can inhibit the toxic effects or infectivity of pathogens by binding them, preventing them from becoming locally invasive. Uh, This is termed neutralization. They can also coat the pathogen that can then enable the accessory cells of our innate immune system to recognize the FC portion and effectively ingest and kill the pathogen, and that's called opsonization. And finally, the antibodies can also trigger complement, and complement is another component of our innate immune system that can strongly enhance the opsonization profile and can directly kill some bacterial cells. Now, what we also need to appreciate is that parental vaccines, the ones that inject into our arms, are often ineffective in stimulating a mucosal immune response, which, as you can imagine, would be best created or magnified if the antigen was presented there. And just to Uh, be clear, uh, mucosal is as opposed to antibody that's um, being transported in your blood. This is antibody yes. that is secreted into your, you know, respiratory route or your GI tract. And the only, you know, as I was developing this thread, I was thinking about polio. Polio is the exception to this rule because the parental polio vaccine is quite effective. And but I, I don't know enough neurotrophic immunology to know is that be, the parental vaccine for polio good because it knocks out. The serum antibodies prevent the neurotrophic potential yeah, right. of that virus. To, to get to the CNS, the virus has to go through the blood. So blood. There they yeah. encounter antibody, and that stops it. Right. So as a basis for this work, the authors offer that there is a substantial body of evidence suggesting that antibodies generated against the Shigella O antigen play a crucial role in providing protection. So other workers have done that. They then hypothesized that the fusion of the outer membrane vesicles that they abbreviate OMVs and that are expressing the Shigella O antigen could represent the basis for a very highly effective vaccine. Further, they compared the wild type Shigella outer membrane vesicles to those derived from mature and other engineered bacteria or even an attenuated delivery vector such that we can make in the lab like E. coli or Salmonella. And they argue that an engineered delivery vector like Salmonella would be more conducive to genetic engineering since we have better genetic systems. It's not as dangerous to work with. All of the reasons you work with um, engineered type cloning vehicles. And that would then potentially develop uh, an immune response and better control of virulence. So our story is to evaluate the feasibility of delivering a vector-based outer membrane vesicle from Salmonella typhimurium carrying the Shigella O polysaccharide antigen. 
and then explore its utility as a potential vaccine candidate. I just, now, I, I just love the design. It's so clever, so elegant. And, and, you know, Michelle touched on one of the hallmarks of this paper, and I want to commend the authors for their first figure. In three panels, they walk us through the data they're going to present. The first panel describes their construction scheme of the plasmid, what's going to be expressed, how it's going to be done. The second panel describes the molecular model of the structure of the Shigella antigen complex and how it will be expressed in salmonella. And then the final panel describes the immunization and challenge protocols that they lay out for the mouse experiments. So I'm a firm believer, if you know where you're going, you're going to have a better time on your journey. And I really did. When they laid out that first figure, I said, okay, this is twin material. I I can work with this because I really understand where they're going. And their first results they describe concerns their construction project. And here we have a salmonella outer membrane vesicle delivering the Shigella O polysaccharide antigens. And the authors go to great pains on their rationale and caveats in their construction. And the highlights were they used a low copy number plasmid. They obtained the outer membrane vesicles by a density gradient centrifugation process. They showed us what the vesicles look like via cryo EM. And what they found were these beautiful spherical outer membrane vesicles with a bilayer membrane. The good news is that there was no apparent difference in the outer membrane vesicle conformation due to the deletion of the other players of the LPS, namely AMP A, AMP C, and AMP D proteins, which are the major porins in salmonella compared to the wild type salmonella outer membrane vesicles. And this is important when you're thinking about how to make a vaccine construct that's not going to be too reactogenic. And their figures are crystal clear and beautiful. They then evaluated the safety of their outer membrane vesicle preparation as a vaccine. First, they assess it in vitro using a macrophage viability assay. Here they take a cell line of macrophage cells, the raw 264.7 cells. They then treat those cells with the vesicles for 24 hours, and they ask the question, is the membrane of that cell line still intact? If they were cytotoxic, it would leak and you would get a different signal fluorescently. The experiment is shown in their second figure, and it remarkably shows that neither the outer membrane vaccine construct nor the vector elicited any apparent cytotoxicity. However, when they really upped the concentration of the outer membrane vesicles, that resulted in slight cell lysis. Mm. Now, this is a crucial experiment for anyone who's ever filled out an IACUC application (laughs) when they're going to take it to animal studies. They want to make certain that death is not going to be an endpoint from your experiment unless that's your intent. And recognize that in spite of expressing the heterologous polysaccharide antigen, this outer membrane vaccine was sufficiently safe in vitro for subsequent evaluation in vivo. They then confirmed it was Shigella, the O antigen, by silver staining and Western blots. And these are beautiful silver stains and Western blots. Next, they addressed whether the antibody response from the salmonella-derived outer membrane vesicles was what you would imagine. So mice immunized with the recombinant uh, outer membrane vaccine or the vector alone from salmonella or simply phosphate buffer saline. And they did this by an intranasal injection method where you squirt something into the nose of the mouth or intraperitoneal in administration. The assessment measured the concentrations of antibodies produced from the recombinant, the salmonella vector, or the control. And the concentration of antibodies, including IgG, 
the vaginal IgA, the lung wash IgA, the IgG, IgG1, and IgG2 were, were quite remarkable. And they measure this by beautiful ELISA assays. And what we saw is immunization with the vaccine construct resulted in significantly higher anti-Shigella LPS IgG levels than the outer membrane vector alone, both by intranasal and IP immunization, whereas the IgG levels from the PBS control were um, un- unremarkable. Second, it's important to emphasize that as did the authors, that mucosal immunity as the first line of host defense plays a critical role in the prevention of the pathogenic infection. So their observation of secretory immunoglobulin A, including those secreted by the vagina and the lung, are some of the most important data points to measure and describe as they will be the most important factors in preventing the infection from taking hold in in the animal. So again, we see polysaccharide antigen induced a significant mucosal antibody response against Shigella LPS. However, no significant mucosal antibody response against LPS was detected in mice eight weeks after their intraperitoneal immunization. Um, And again, they measured IgG1 and IgG2. And again, a digression for the non-immunologist, IgG1 is the most abundant IgG subclass of human sera, and it's important for mediating antibody responses against viral pathogens. So it does this by binding soluble proteins and membrane protein antigens via its variable domain. IgG2, on the other hand, plays a role in protection against protein antigens, but is predominantly responsible for anti-carbohydrate IgG responses against bacterial capsular polysaccharides and like we're seeing here, the outer membrane uh, cap um, O antigen. In addition, the concentrations of Salmonella typhimurian LPS specific IgG induced by the outer membrane vaccine or the vector remained low in both routes, indicating that the outer membrane vector in which the O antigen was deleted did not stimulate an excessive nonspecific immune response that could interfere with the production of the Shigella LPS immune response. Again, think about using salmonella as a platform technology. They also systematically compared um, the amount, the IgA response, so the secretory um, IgA response, when the vaccine was delivered intranasally versus into the gut, intraperitoneal. And as we would predict, the intranasal um, inoculation gave a much stronger secretory IgA. And now they're going to walk us into the T cell arm of our immune system. And they did this by asking whether or not the outer membrane vesicles delivering the Shigella O antigen stimulated Shigella LPS specific splenic lymphocyte proliferation. So this gives us our window into the T cell response. The priming of our cell-mediated immune response is essential if the vaccine is going to confer protection long-term from disease. And although it is through this proliferation of splenic cells in response that we get our glimpse, and the results were as you might expect. The spleen cells extracted from mice in which that were vaccinated with the outer membrane vaccine uh, that were either intranasally and incubated with uh, the Shigella flexor and I dis, uh, LPS displayed significant lymphos- lymphocyte proliferation 
similar to that of the positive control, which is phytohemagglutinin. And the negative controls were negative, as reported, no apparent proliferation of the splenic lymphocytes. So again, their vector and the vaccine are doing what is anticipated by their hypothesis. And again, not surprising to me, the level of splenic lymphocyte proliferation induced either by the outer membrane vaccine or the vector with intraperitoneal administration was lower than that for intranasal administration. So, you know, obviously you want to put this in where it's going to do um, the most good. And the next section of their paper dealt with the cell-mediated immune side of the vaccine, namely looking for Th1 and Th2 polarization. And what these two immune complexes do is they secrete instructive cytokines that facilitate an immune reaction. So again, they monitored a bunch of cytokines from gamma interferon to interleukin-12 to IL-13 and IL-6 and TNF-alpha as a way to assess the extent of the Th1, Th2 polarization. And if you look at their experiment, you will appreciate the conundrum we are in with respect to SARS. Here, the splenocytes treated with LPS from Flex and I were used to enhance immunity in order to detect cytokines. We can't do that with the human population. No one's going to give up their spleen cells. So uh, they found that interferon gamma, IL-12, IL-4, and IL-13 levels in spleen cells from both the intranasal and intraperitoneal groups increased compared to the PBS control. In addition, the levels of interferon gamma, IL-12, and IL-4 in cells treated with the outer membrane vaccine via both routes of administration were higher than the vector control. And finally, that we're moving to the acid test, whether or not this will work in the full animal. And they showed, um, in particular, mouse splenocytes immunized with the intraperitoneal outer membrane vaccine displayed higher TNF-alpha levels than those receiving it intranasally indicating that intraperitoneal immunization with the outer membrane vaccine may induce a mild inflammatory response. You know, no one likes a bad vaccine reaction compared to the intranasal. When they challenged the animal, they asked whether the outer membrane vesicles delivering this Shigella O antigen induced effective bactericidal activity. In here, the graphs are just exquisite. You see sera from immunized mice were used in a serum bactericidal assay, and it's so crystal clear. The intranasal, you know, all the way out to about one in 800 dilutions of the sera was able to suppress the growth of the shigella. The intraperitoneal was still good. You could suppress growth to about 30% out to about one in 400. And it's, it's just a beautiful set of experiments. And then they asked the next question, if a mouse could survive a challenge. So here, at five weeks after booster immunization, the mice were challenged with a virulent Shigella infection by administering either a million by nose or 50 million bacteria via intraperitoneal injection. This stringent challenge resulted in 100% mortality in animals that received PBS, whereas the immunized mice uh, were 100% protected. And that's, that's pretty good by anyone's um, way, shape, or form. And again, the take-home message is that this salmonella-derived outer membrane vaccine provides significant protection against virulent forms of Shigella in a mouse model of lung pneumonia and shigellosis. 
And so, you know, tying it up into a neat bow, this study presents a novel strategy of delivering some of the hardest things to make vaccines to, namely carbohydrates. And they're co-conjugating this polysaccharide antigen using this biosynthetic salmonella carrier and these outer membrane vesicles, demonstrating both immunogenicity and protective efficacy of the vaccine against uh, virulent challenge infections in either the the lung model or in um, the other model that they tested. So it it was, it was really a, a a one-stop shopping. You got your review of immunology, you learned how to make a vaccine, and we now have hopefully what will amount to a vaccine against Shigella. Michael, who, who would this vaccine be for? It would be for individuals in developing nations. Mm-hmm. I mean, you could imagine that you could, I mean, we do have salmonella-based vaccines that are live vaccines presently. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's for salmonella uh, typhi. You effectively drink them and they express and you're uh, protected against salmonella typhi. And so you could well imagine that this vector could be used or if you could do an intranasal inoculation via these outer membrane vesicles. So you don't need, um, again, I don't know how long cold storage will be needed but you know, intranasally is certainly much more attractive than an injection. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the authors are careful to point out this is a proof of concept, and now they yeah. can do the more um, uh, detailed experiments to learn, like what's the appropriate dosing and etc. But but also the the idea um, people may not be maybe a little bit um, uh, surprised to hear that they use actually outer membrane vesicles shed from mm-hmm. a bacterium. It's not a highly purified protein prep, mm. but there's excellent precedent. Um, we have a authorized vaccine that's been in use here in the United States since 2015 against um, meningitis, um, meningococcal meningitis mm. that is made of four components, but one of the components are outer membrane vesicles um, shed by Neisseria meningitidis. So there is um, precedent for this approach. So the key to the outer membrane is the LPS being an adjuvant, right? That, that's well, no, the it. LPS is the antigen too. Yep. And it can also package other um, antigens. Because I'm just thinking whether you could make it synthetically. If you knew what the vesicle had that made it uh, a good adjuvant, could you synthesize it like we synthesize lipid nanoparticles for the mRNA vaccines? Yeah, I don't know. I, th- I mean, salmonella grows so well. Um, it's probably why not let the bacteria, to- yeah churn out the, uh, be the factories to churn out these outer membrane vesicles, mm-hmm. especially if, if they can demonstrate it is safe. And certainly the meningococcal outer membrane vesicles are safe. Uh, mm-hmm. There's got a great record um, using in children under the age of two. Mm-hmm. They do mention that this is going to be a platform. They could put multiple uh, antigens in, not just one, right? Right. Yes. That would be good. You get them all, you combine multiple vaccines in mm-hmm. one that is always beneficial and like, you don't have the issues that you have with making viral vaccines where you don't have the real estate to clone into mm-hmm. the other thing i liked about this paper besides just its elegant design to take the shigella antigen and have it expressed mm-hmm. in salmonella was just how systematic they were to just do side-by-side comparisons interperitoneal versus intranasal the vector versus the vector plus the antigen i mean they they and they show all their data. It's really um, a beautiful presentation. Yeah, it's it's a good idea. But I think when you make when you do things like this, you always have to have some idea of what the um, eventual use will be, even if right. it's just a proof of concept, right? Yep. So if you were a traveler going to places where it was endemic, you might want to get this vaccine, right? Certainly. Just like we you get. Do not uh, want, you do not want to get Shigella. It's not foot pleasant having had it. You had it. I had it. Wow. I, I was on a trip overseas, and I experienced the full force of Shigella dysentery. Uh, I'm sorry. But to your point, they, they do say that it, um, it's estimated to cause 165 million cases each year, mostly mm-hmm. in children mm-hmm. under the age of five in developing countries, where it's um, more difficult to keep the wastewater separate from the drinking water. 
And diarrheal diseases still kill kill more yeah. kids. Yep. Especially in places where they don't get rehydrated very well, right? right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Very nice. Thank you, Michael. And thank you, Applied and Environmental Microbiology, for two papers. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. That'll do it for TWIM number 251. You can find the show notes at microbe.tv slash TWIM. Uh, if you want to send us a question or comment, those have dried up, folks. I know a lot yes. of you are still listening. What happened to your questions and comments? We got to give in. away a book. We got to give away a book. Well, that's what we do over on Twiv. <clears throat> you know, uh-huh. <laughs> authors get free copies of their textbooks. So I gave all mine away except for one or two. Twim, T W I M at microbe.tv for your questions and comments. And if you like what we do, we'd love your financial support. You can go to microbe.tv slash contribute for several ways. You could contribute to the entire family of Microbe TV podcasts. Michelle Swanson's at the University of Michigan. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you both, and happy September. Happy September. Mm -hmm. Was it August the last we recorded? Is that right? No. No, it's but it's, you know, once we're past Labor Day now and the academic year has started, so it really feels like the seasons have changed. Yeah, you know how I know it's school year because when I drive, it's always a mess in the morning and the afternoons when the kids are going into school or out. Right. The buses back up the traffic and the crossing guards and all that. But that is to be celebrated that we're able to get kids hopefully safely back to school. I just hope they're safe. Yep. Me too. Yep. This is going to next two weeks. We will see what happens. Yes, we will. Michael Schmitz at the Medical University of South Carolina. Thank you, Michael. Thanks, everyone. And I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I'd like to thank the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIM and Ronald Jenkins for the music. This episode of TWIM was edited by Ray Ortega. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll see you next time on This Week in Microbiology.